Welcome to She Sells Radio. I have to tell you, this is an episode that I have probably rarely been as excited to record as this one that I'm about to do for you today. And today I'm going to be diving all into this past week, which I spent at the Marco Island uh, advanced retreat for Dr. Joe Dispenza. And it was life-changing in a way where I don't know if I'm going to be able to fill it into a, just one episode. So I may do a follow-up to this, but I'm going to share with you some of the biggest things that I'm taking away from that, that I'm going to use to shift my life and how I create and how I show up. And that I think you'll want to implement in yours as well. So before we get into that, I want to do just a couple quick announcements of some exciting things going on. And I'll also say, before I get into that, I did get COVID, um, a couple of days ago. And so if my voice is not quite as strong as it usually is, please just bear with me. I may need to take a couple more breaks than usual. As I talk, I appreciate your patience, but I was like, I can't wait to record this episode because I got to tell you all about this. It was, it was that good. So the two quick announcements, number one, if you're listening to this in real time, we have a workshop this week. It's for women who want to break through six figures or beyond this year for women who want to create more financial abundance, learn how to sell in a way that feels authentic to them and are really ready to go for it and make that change that maybe you've been wanting to make for a while or do that thing that you've been saying for a while. Oh, that would be great if I could, but such and such excuse, right? These excuses that we make, if you're ready to really just step into your greatness this year in 2022 and stop putting off your abundance, stop putting off your dream, your vision, this workshop is going to be for you. So you can go to elisearcher.com slash workshop uh, for our, your year for six figures workshop happening this week. I'm going to be pouring into you, coaching you all the things. It's going to be amazing. The second announcement before we get into the episode is we are hiring and I've got some really amazing, I feel like dream positions available within the team right now. And since you're a listener, you know what we're all about. And if you're someone who wants to create wealth in your life while also really positively impacting the world and empowering our clients to go forth and create more abundance in their life and heal generational patterns of scarcity and trauma and lack conditioning and doubting themselves. Uh, this could be a really great team for you to be a player on. So you can go to elisearcher.com slash careers. If you want to check out the open positions and apply, if you feel called. So with that, let's get into, let's get into what happened last week. So we were in Marco Island, Florida for, uh, Dr. Joe's week long advanced retreat. And if you are, a client of mine, if you've been in the community for any amount of time, you probably know, um, he's got a bit of a cult following here in the, she sells community in a really good way. All my women, I shouldn't say all, most, all of them and my male clients do his meditations, follow his rewired series on Gaia. Um, and I love having my clients watch his work because in, in the, she sells world, it's really about those quick, not quick from like a strivey standpoint, but quick from a, how much longer are you wanting to wait to let in your greatness and what you've been wanting to create? Like that type of standpoint, we're about making those types of quantum leaps. And so what I love about Joe's work is it helps explain from a scientific standpoint, as well as from a spiritual standpoint, how do those things happen? And how do we create those quantum leaps in our lives where we're doing things where other people say, that shouldn't be possible, or it shouldn't be possible in that amount of time. And you're creating great results while also being really happy and really grateful and really energized. And so I love his work. I use it every single day in my life. And this was the first time I got to actually go be in person at one of these events. And there's definitely something special about being in the room. And it pushed me. It challenged me in a lot of ways. If you've been to one of his events, it's long hours. So this isn't a cushy, you know, nine to five type of retreat situation. <laughs> uh, it will push you. And I'll share with you some more of that in the episode today, but I'm going to share roughly 10 
of my biggest takeaways, ahas, things that happened that were unique. And, um, and I'll share with you to the best of my understanding what they were. So the first thing I want to share is some of the physical things that I experienced at this event and that I saw other people experiencing too. So the quantum model of reality and what Dr. Joe teaches and what I believe is that the, the body is an extension of the mind. So we're always working from the inside out to create change. And there was, there were several very interesting physical experiences that I had in my body while we were there. Um, one of them was the final three days of the event. You do healings on other people. Now I've never done a, I mean, I've, I've sent good energy. I've sent good vibes. Like I've held the space and intention of healing in my own body. And for other people around me, never have I cultivated energy in my body to such an extent where my whole body was basically seizing. I don't know any other way to explain it. The amount of energy that was flowing through and then delivered that energy to somebody else who needed a physical healing. And it's kind of one of those things where you've got to be there to experience it, maybe to believe it. I mean, I'll just share my experience of it, but when we were doing these healings, there were several people, not several, about a hundred people who had volunteered um, for and requested a healing going into this event. Take a quick coffee sip and then I'm gonna get back into it. So with, with that, they were the healies and the rest of us were the healers. And three different days we did this. Each day was a little bit different. We did a slightly different prep process each day. The first day was like a 45 minute walking meditation to cultivate the energy. The second day was less Then the third day. We just went right into it. But as a healer, what I experienced was so unique from anything I've ever experienced in my life, because my energy and my focus was totally on someone else and on delivering that healing energy to somebody else in a way it's never been before. And what I kept repeating to myself going into it was like, I'm going to get out of the way and let source spirit, God, whatever your word is flow through me, because that has to happen right now for this healing to happen. And as I did that and just focused on continuously getting out of the way and focused on this person being healed, literally the energy flowing through my body was so intense and so strong. I could not stop shaking, but not a little bit of shaking. Like I had whiplash type of shaking. I don't know any other way to explain it. And there were other people having the same thing happen to them. I saw it throughout the event. It looks like you're having a seizure. I can't explain it any other way. Um, somebody asked one of my clients asked that I share Jason's experience, my husband who went with me on this. And I wanted to just plug that here because he had, he doesn't cry a lot. I really, he's not someone I see cry often when we went into the healing, I could tell it's going to make me emotional when I say this, but he was sitting next to me for the first one. There was a moment where it was like his heart broke wide open and he was sobbing, (laughs) makes me emotional. He was sobbing and he said, I've never felt so much love in my life. And it was, and he then got to deliver that energy into this person who we were doing the healing for. Um, and to see a man in that state, there were a lot of men who had those types of experiences. There was really, really powerful, um, in a way I, I can't really explain, but it was, it was pretty profound. Um, but from that, what I took is we each have so much more energy available to flow through us than we realize. And that's the only way I can put it. Um, but the healings that happened at this as a result of some of that energy flowing, there were true physical healings that, you know, you you hear about it and it sounds like biblical type stuff happening, but a woman's hearing was completely restored. A woman's um, skin condition that she'd had since she was three months old, she's 37, disappeared. And, and that for her, that had happened right before the event because she'd been doing the meditations and the work on herself for the past year. But she came up and shared her story and showed the before and after photos. Um, the woman whose healing was restored, that was at the event. 
she went in there not being able to hear, came out with perfect hearing. Um, there's so much more that you have available to you from an energy standpoint, from a possibility standpoint, than you realize. The other part of the physical that was really interesting to me was if you've done Dr. Joe's pineal gland meditation, um, there was a lot of that at this event. Every single day we were doing that. So the pineal gland is if you study the energy centers, it's the sixth energy center in your body. There's different ways everybody classifies this. So you've got to use your own language. Some people would call it the third eye, the seat of your intuition, et cetera. But there's a certain breath that he teaches that we did every day where you draw up your cerebrospinal fluid. Wow. I actually said that <laughs> your cerebrospinal fluid from the base of your spine. You draw it up through those first three energy centers in your body, which are all about survival up through your heart. And then you actually aim it. And a lot of this is mental, uh, mental energy and focus, but you aim it at that pineal gland. Now I didn't quite get to the point that a lot of people got with this, but what happens is there's such a release and a liberation of energy when you're pulling that you're physically pulling that energy up from those first three energy centers where it gets stuck and stored in those survival emotions, pulling it up. And it's almost like alchemy where you're pulling up through those energy centers and then you transmute it into love, wisdom, peace, right? Whatever higher level emotion you pull up through your heart and it hits that pineal gland, which for many people is they don't, they don't focus on activating it. Again, I'm explaining this to the best of my understanding here. So please bear with me. Um, but it's not really something I was super aware of before going into this event. I had done his pineal gland meditation before I'd had some interesting experiences, but nothing that was really profound. What happened for me here was I felt like it opened. That's really the best way to say it. I felt more energy in that center than I had felt before. And I did when we were in meditation, I did start to see things that I hadn't seen before. So I started to have visions. I started to kind of see, as he talks about behind the veil, that was really interesting to me. Um, but it almost, <laughs> this is going to sound funny. It's like you're, when you really open this thing up and you really get the energy up there, um, it's kind of like you're having an orgasm in your brain. I don't know any better way to say it, but it sounds like people are having orgasms when they really hit it. <laughs> and around the room, when we would do this thing, people would literally be full body shaking, falling on the floor, screaming, like in bliss, not in, not in pain. If you look at this from the outside, you think people are really hurting. No, people were in bliss and it was profound to watch this. So I had a little bit of that. I didn't quite get it there to the level that a lot of people did at the event, but I'm going to keep practicing it now that I'm home. And the one thing I'll say is I've started just doing that breath every day and it really, it gets you energized. It pumps energy into your brain. It gets you feeling more grounded, more connected, more centered as you go into your day. And it's a quick thing you can do anytime. In fact, I'm actually, as I record this, I'm like, oh, I wish I had done it right before the podcast. Cause it would be a great thing to do before something that requires mental energy and stimulation like that. But that was, that was really unique and interesting to incorporate that every day and then see the experiences other people were having too, when they unlock that center, there's so much more to it than I can get into today for this episode. And I also, again, I'm going to explain it to the best of my understanding, but I would follow Dr. Joe's work to really go deep into that gland, into how it works and into how you can use it to just tap into whole new frequencies of thought of vibration of possibility, because there's a whole lot that happens once you open that up in your mind. And it's like a whole nother level of power that you tap into that we normally aren't accessing throughout the day. So that was all the first takeaway, the physical things. The second thing is I realized how much farther we can go than we often go. This event pushed me physically. So like I mentioned, when we started, this is not a 9 a.m. conference start type of thing. The latest we started was 630 in the morning and the earliest we started, we actually had to get there at 330. 
for a 4 a.m. meditation that then lasted four and a half hours. It was a four and a half hour pineal gland meditation. <laughs> now I meditate at home every day, but I was probably doing a 20 minute to an hour meditation a day. And he told us I hadn't been tracking, but he told us you meditate 35 hours this week while you're here. And that really blew me away because how often, and I do this, I've done this for sure. How often do we say, I've only got time for a 20 minute today. I've only got time for a five minute meditation today. I got so conditioned to going so much longer in this week that now I did a 40 minute one this morning and it felt like it was two minutes. It, it goes so like your perception of time shifts so much. But the other thing I got to practice was I felt my body, especially at the beginning of the week, feeling anxious, like it should be doing more, like it should be sending an email or doing a social post. And I got to really practice being versus doing and being for long amounts of time. And I realized how okay that is and how much more I'm going to talk in a moment about creating from energy rather than from matter, but how much more we can accomplish when we are in that state versus the other. So I want you to just imagine right now, like, what would it be like for me to do a four and a half hour meditation at 4 AM? And what are the limiting beliefs showing up for me around that? Because 1400 people did it and, uh, and had really profound experiences. I did too. And I didn't think I could do it before going into it, but you can always do more than you think you can. Okay. Here's the third thing. Now I'm going to get into some of the kind of tweetable moments or key takeaways that I wrote down in my journal that I felt like, Oh my gosh, these are, these are just really important takeaways from the event. The first thing here, um, so this is number three, if you're keeping track, this is number three in our list of 10 is this mindset shift of thinking of yourself as wearing a virtual reality headset. So if you follow Dr. Joe's work, you'll, you'll know that he talks about this VR headset that we wear and again, follow his work for his best explanation of it. But the way that I think about it is in our physical world. So in your 3d reality, your senses are what plug you into reality. So if you took away hearing, tasting, smelling, touching sight, um, case, you wouldn't, you would be nothing right? You wouldn't have, you wouldn't be plugged into this reality, but there's something beyond this, which is what the whole event is about accessing. And in the 3d, the game in this headset is competition. It's lack, it's scarcity, it's survival, it's overcoming. And so if you're plugged into that all day long and you get fooled, that that's the reality, then that's the rules of the game. You're going to have to play by. And one of the things he said that really struck me was you can get addicted to a life you don't even like, right? Like those survival emotions are addictive. They create a lot of cortisol in your body. They create a lot of stress energy. And that is actually very addictive chemicals. So I want you to just think about, am I addicted to a life I don't even like, like, is any part of me addicted to this? And what he says is you have to be willing to lay down the character you play in the VR headset. You have to be willing to lay down the character you play in the VR headset. Now, what I love about this, this is so aligned with what we teach at She Sells. And this is in my own life. My quantum leap experiences have always been because I got really conscious of when I was playing a character, when I was showing up with old conditioning, old patterning. And I started actively focusing on playing a new character. That new character may be very unfamiliar. That new character is not someone who naturally does the things the old me would do. But if we want to get different results, we got to show up differently. Right. And so laying down that character you play in the VR headset to me is so such a powerful way to think about this. Um, there's so many applications to it, but if you thought about that and you thought about, well, who's the character I've been conditioned to play and thinking of it more as a character in a game rather than the real you and getting really curious as to, well, if I could create any character that I wanted 
to create any outcome that I wanted, how would that character show up and how would they act and what would they do? And when we do that, that's when things get exciting. One of the other things he said that I I wrote down is who are you pretending not to be? Who are you pretending not to be? And that one is big. I feel like I have so many quotes for you in this episode, but who are you pretending not to be? Here's how I think about that for this community. The goal that you have, the vision that you have, that is there for you because that is meant for you. That's the only reason it's there. But when you pretend not to be that person, when you pretend like that's bigger than you, scarier than you're able to do, like you're not worthy of it. You're literally pushing it away from you and creating separation from it. So who is it that you're pretending not to be? And who are you going to start deciding to be? If you just thought about this to me, this also helps take a lot of the pressure off that we can put on ourselves in life. If you just decided to think about your whole life, like what if I thought about this, like I was a character playing a game in this VR headset. And I realized I can create a new character at any point and create a new outcome. How would I show up? What character would I want to play? Who would I decide to really be and step into being? And it's a fun way to think about it. It's, it's a intense way to think about it, but it will shift a lot for you. And it's part of how I train my clients to really create those quantum leap moments is by, it's almost like you're acting at first until you're not anymore. But when you want to create that new reality, it's not enough to just think about it, but then not show up as it throughout the day. We have to do all of that. We have to, we have to fall in love with the idea. We have to emotionalize it. And then we have to practice showing up as it throughout the day. And when we think about it, like a VR headset, to me, it makes it fun and a little bit easier. Okay. The fourth takeaway, nobody chooses you, you choose you. Nobody chooses you, you choose you. And I love that he said that. Cause I thought, I feel like I say that in some of my workshops and in my live streams. And this is, this is big. So I used to spend a lot of time in self-doubt. I used to give a lot of mental headspace to thinking about why I wasn't going to do well with something or why something wasn't going to go the way I wanted it to. And I just kind of realized one day, why am I like, if I'm the one who has to live my life and no one is really, it's no one else's job to be my cheerleader. Who am I waiting to come choose me? And why am I not cheering myself on like my very best cheerleader every single day? And it's a powerful shift. If you start to doubt or question yourself, which is, that's part of the game, right? That's part of, especially if you're in that VR headset and you're, you've gotten plugged in there a little bit too long and you're doubting and questioning. Uh, but those are also normal things that happen when we set new goals that we haven't accomplished before the brain goes into, can I do this? Is this possible? I haven't done it before. Uh, but instead of doubting or questioning yourself, what if you chose yourself? What if you chose yourself And one of the other things he said, because he was talking about who knows, you know, what happens after this, but if you believe that you go on past this life into eternity, he said, you're going to be stuck with you for a long time. So you might as well fall in love with you. You're going to be stuck with you for a long time. You might as well fall in love with you. So if you thought about it that way and you thought, oh my gosh, I am this eternal being that's on this eternal journey. Whew, I'm going to suck with myself for this whole thing. Maybe I should start having some fun with myself. Maybe I should start loving myself. Maybe I should start choosing myself, knowing that I'm kind of playing a game here and I want the game to be as fun and as exciting and as expansive as it can be. I want to be that star in my own movie. So what if I started thinking about it like that and sharing myself on instead of beating yourself, myself up. So I loved that one. Number five, and I, this whole part here could be 10 episodes. We're not going to get too deep into it, but I wanted to take a moment and just talk about my deeper 
I don't know if it's deeper understanding, but kind of renewed understanding of creating using quantum physics versus creating matter on matter. So there's two different ways you can create, right? One is matter on matter, which is how most people create. It's how I created for most of my life. And that's, I'm in this 3d reality. If I want to go from here to having this amount of money, having this home, having this car, I'm going to have to work X amount of time. I'm going to have to push harder. I'm going to have to do these things. You're always having to do something to accomplish the goal. Well, with the quantum model of reality, when we apply energy on matter, it's you're causing an effect in matter from aligning your energy with the reality that you want to create. And we do that by getting our thoughts in alignment with what we want to create and then getting our emotions aligned as well. And so when we do that, things happen in a very different way. Things typically happen much faster. Things happen with far less, if any effort at all, and it will defy your, at least for me, it did. It will defy your beliefs of what's possible until you experience it for yourself. And you kind of have to suspend disbelief until it happens for you. I've shared some of my own stories of these things happening on the podcast. I'm not going to get it into any of my own stories of that today, but what I will say is that he shared at the event stories of people literally creating something from nothing, like truly creating something from nothing. And to me, that just got me excited about thinking of how powerful can this get? Like how powerful could I become as I learn to be higher and higher vibrational and letting things be easier and easier in life. And so one of the things he said is the closer you are to source, when you create the less time it takes. So the closer you are to source, when you create the less time it takes. And when we say closer to source, you want to think about the, the vibration and the frequency of source is one of wholeness. It's one of pure love. So when we create things, um, and we're in that energy, it takes very little time. And that's when people are creating something out of nothing or very minimal effort, the lower frequency we are. So if the lower, the emotion and your emotions or your body's conscious awareness of what frequency you're at. So the lower, the emotion you're at, when you're creating the longer amount of time it's going to take, cause then you're more matter, you're less energy. So it's a very, it's, it's actually very simple when you think about it, but the takeaway for me from that is to always, always, always number one, first and foremost, prioritize being in that energy of wholeness, being in that energy of gratitude, being in that energy of love and bliss. And I know it's not possible. At least I don't think it's possible all the time. I haven't experienced that yet in my life. And I'll, I'll share some of the ways that things felt really tough last week, um, in this episode as well. But when we have that conscious awareness of, okay, if I want to create powerfully and if I want to make the quantum leap and I don't want to effort and push and hustle my way to get to this outcome, I got to get pretty close to source. Like I got to get my emotions, my energy, my vibration aligned with that energy that already has everything in it. So when we do that, when we're in alignment with source, when we're showing up as source, you don't have to go anywhere or do anything. It's already all there. So the closer you are to source, when you create the less time it takes, and this is a rule of thumb that I would apply to your inner work and to your, if, if hopefully you're doing some sort of a morning routine, morning ritual, maybe you're doing one of Dr. Joe's meditations, but he says, don't expect any magic to happen in your life. If you get back up as the same person who sat down. And so this is where we get to be really fierce with ourselves and we get to add a little bit more intentionality to our meditations, to our visualization, to the work we're doing. Because if you sit down and you're in a state of anywhere from boredom all the way down to grief, despair, fear, and you get up and you're still in that same state. It's not that it was a waste of time per se, because I don't think there's a bad meditation. I think every time everyone's a little bit different. They're not all like 
let me go right home about this one, right? <laughs> you got to persist through those. But if you're looking to create a change using energy, if you're looking to have something unusual happen in your life, not because you're efforting, but because of who you're being, don't expect that to happen if you stand back up as the same person who sat down. So that's something that I just recommitted to this past week because in full transparency, and I'd had, I'd had a bit of time where I wasn't having bad meditations, but I was kind of just like going through the motions with things. Um, and, and I just recommitted to that this past week. I am not, I don't care if the meditation's over and I'm still there. I don't care if I've been sitting for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour, I'm going to sit with myself until I can stand up as a different person who sat down here. So it's, it's a, it's a discipline is what I will say. But when you do that, you know, an hour in a meditation where you're powerfully connected can be the equivalent of a hundred hours of work that you would do manually. So stop thinking it's a waste of time. Stop thinking it's stop thinking you don't have time. And it's kind of like Buddha, the Buddha said, right. I, I usually meditate, or I think it was the Dalai Lama actually. Um, when he was asked how long he meditates an hour a day, unless, unless I'm really busy then I meditate for two. So we have to learn to shift our thinking and get out of that headset mode of thinking of, I've got to be doing things all the time to make something happen. And to learn that if you really want to make some things happen, but you want to do it in a faster and more effective way, spend your time getting your energy aligned first before you take any action. And 90% of the action will be taken care of for you in most situations. So that's the, uh, that's kind of a quick recap on the quantum model and creating in that way versus matter on matter. So one more quick coffee sip, and then, uh, and then I'm going to talk to you about emotions and how important those are in just a second. So, oh, this one is good. The power of minding your emotions and being attuned to them. And I say, this as someone who had so much just low grade anxiety for years. Sometimes it was more than low grade. I ha I've had periods of panic attacks in my life. Um, but for the most part, it was kind of just this low grade consistent anxiety. And I didn't know why. And I just thought it was normal, but when you become aware of that and you become aware that you can shift your emotional state and nothing different has to happen in your life in order for you to do it. And in fact, if we go back to what we just talked about, which is when you're creating energy on matter versus matter on matter, you're always creating from the inside out. So if you want something different to happen in your life, you can control that by shifting your vibration, which is shifting your emotions. So it's so important though, because one of the things he said that I just really resonated with is people are only suggestible to information equal to their emotional state. So I'll say that again. People are only suggestible to information equal to their emotional state. And so, you know, he, we did talk some at this event about, you know, if you want to get a lot of people to be kind of sheep, get them scared and then pump them with a bunch of scary information and then they'll act on that. Right. And that's how a lot of our society works. A lot of mass media works. But you can think of this in your own life, you know, when you're in that state, like if you've ever been in a state of just pure, like gratitude and bliss and joy for life, the ideas that flow through you in those moments are so profound. And in those moments, you're like, yeah, like life is amazing. I want to help everybody. And you, you know, someone brings you an amazing idea that would literally change the world. And you're like, yes, let's take action on that. Let's do that together. But if you're in a lower emotional state, if you're in a state of grieving or victimhood or blame or guilt, and someone brings you that same idea, what are you going to do? You're going to say it would never work. That's pie in the sky. You're not like, you're not being realistic. So your emotions almost create this box. This is how I'm thinking about it. It's almost this like box where only information that's equal to those emotions can flow into you at that time. So if you knew that, 
And if you wanted to create better results in your life, but you knew that in order to access really high level ideas and information, you needed to be in an emotional state that was the equivalent to them. Wouldn't you spend a little more time on your emotional hygiene? And wouldn't you be a little more self-aware of when you're dipping into a negative state, a suffering state, and take the time to shift it instead of just trying to push through it? So that to me is, I, I used to not prioritize that. You know, I was the push through it girl, like, you know, stuff the emotions. And I literally would stuff them with food with, I never had a big alcohol thing, but I would, you know, have a cocktail and try to numb, um, a lot of numbing behavior for sure. And, um, I didn't, I had no idea. Like it, it actually makes me a little emotional when I say that. Cause I, I look back on 20 year old Elise and it's like, Oh girl, that was a, there was a lot that was really tough during that time. And I know you've probably had experiences like that in your life too, when you were unaware, but when we know this and when we can, um, learn to prioritize this and tap into the emotions first, remembering that people are only suggestible to information equal to their emotional state. That's when things get exciting. And that's when we're more energy, less matter. And that's when, um, that's when we make those quantum leaps. The other thing, this is, it's kind of a number six part two of, about minding your emotions, but this is more about thoughts, but I, I'm going to kind of loop it in here. He said, the moment you think about your problems, you're in the past. The moment you think about your problems, you're in the past. And gosh, how true is that? Right? <laughs> how true is that? And the present is where all possibilities exist. So in that present moment, and this is where meditation comes into play and really detaching from that VR headset and going into just the, he calls it the void, right? Or space of just nothing. All possibilities exist there in the field, but when we're plugged in and when we're thinking about our problems, when we're thinking about what's happening in our sensory world, um, that we're not attached to all possibilities, right? That's why people keep repeating the same situations again and again, repeating the same outcomes because their mind, they let their mind keep playing a loop of the same problem or the same challenge or the same person or the same trigger. And I'm not saying this is easy. This is when you become aware of this and you start to consciously live this way. It feels like such a mental workout every day. Like I will tell you that from personal experience, you, if you're in this with me, like, you know, it is a mental workout. It is mental gymnastics every day to notice when the brain starts going to something, to a problem. Um, because the, that's what your brain is designed to do. So again, I'm not saying this stuff is easy, but you can train it just like an animal to work for you rather than to be your master. So you're not your brain. You're not your body. These are tools that you have to use at your disposal as if you again, think about it like the VR headset, right? This is a tool you've been given to use, but you can't let it master you. You've got to be the master of it. But our problems are, they're just manifestations of the past, right? It's old news. So if you want to create a different future, if you want to create a different reality, and if you want to be open to all possibilities and things that you may think are not, would it ever be possible for you right now? You got to get in the present, my friend. You've got to detach from all of those those old thoughts. And you've got to notice when it starts to cycle back and have that constant awareness and shift. You can say something like shift in the moment. You can say something like change in the moment. You can go do a meditation. You can, in that moment, when you notice your brain going back into a past problem, ask yourself the question, what would I love in this situation? If I could have it any way, what would I love? And there's so many great tools and techniques out there. I've talked about a number of them on the podcast. I teach them to my clients too, but you got to realize when you're, when you're going back and recycling and rehashing that old problem that he did this, she did this, yada, yada, you're going into the past and that's not where your future, you will create a future of more of the past if you do that. But if you want to create a different future, 
you got to shift in that moment to what would you love to experience? What do you want to think? What do you want to have happen? Okay. The seventh thing that was my, one of my takeaways from this past week. And this, this literally happened to me this past week. So I'm speaking to this from very recent experience, but I've also been through similar things before. So I I know what's going on, which is good. I don't fully know how it's all going to come together in this particular circumstance, but, but I'm at peace. Um, Joe talked about this. <laughs> he talked about this, that this happens at the events. And I always kind of warn my clients this too. Like when you come into this work and you really start doing that personal, that deep shifting work, it's the biological death of your old self and your old self doesn't like that. She doesn't like that. He doesn't like that. And it will fight you every step of the way. And it will manifest illness and it will manifest personal problems. And it will manifest things that feel like everything in your life is falling apart to try to keep you from moving forward. And you have to know what's happening in that moment. Nothing is ever falling apart. It's literally when you decide that you're going to create something new in your life and you're going to change as a person, everything that's not in alignment with that person who you want to become, it's going to need to fall away or it's going to need to shift. And that can feel so uncomfortable. It can feel so uncomfortable. I can't tell you in this past week, how many massively uncomfortable moments I've had. Like, I'll just be so real with you and and I'm not going to get into all of them because they're not, I'm in the middle of some of them right now and that's okay. But when you have the conscious awareness that that's what's happening and it's almost like, I kind of think about it like, like these tectonic plates, like shifting and moving to reform the new thing that's being created Um, And you can kind of just let it happen and be at focus on being at peace as much as you can through the process and then staying, just allowing being non-attached to what was, um, it's a much easier process. If you try to grip, if you try to say, Ooh, you know, I, (laughs) this feels too uncomfortable or like at least I, cause your, your, your body is comfortable in the known. So when you decide to make a change, you're going into the unknown and your body's not comfortable with that, nor is your brain. Um, now we can soothe it. There are ways that we can soothe it. There are ways that we can visualize our future and start to create that visual imprint in our brain and in our neural connections so that we have something new to focus on, which is important during these times. But the more not attached we can be to how things were with the trust and the understanding that everything is always happening for you. And even if you've got to remind yourself of that a hundred times a day, a hundred times an hour, while things are shifting around you and you're feeling very uncomfortable, you have to do that. And it will make the process so much easier. It will make the process so much less painful and it will create space for those new opportunities and people and situations to come in that are in alignment with where you're going. And your job is to stay kind of to stay out of the way. And we stay out of the way by not gripping to what was, and then by being open to the nudges and the actions that we feel inspired to take in the moment to move forward towards that next step rather than staying stuck. So just understanding that is really, really key. I think when we're doing this work and I'm reminding myself of it every moment right now, and I'll report more to you when I'm kind of further out of some of this stuff about back end, um, of how things came together, but we get to be at peace with that. And we get to know that every time we ask for an up level, guess what? Tectonic plates shift. I was going to boom, boom, boom. I don't think that's really what it sounds like, (laughs) but you get what I'm saying. That's all that's happening. You just you're in the change. It's, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong. It's actually all really good. So you get to get excited. Okay. Number eight. And these are just final eight, nine, 10 or final three. I think these are going to be the shortest here, but I am so conscious of my own language. Um, and I'm so conscious of my client's language too. And I'm definitely, I'm not perfect with it in my life, but I, I aim to always be aware of when I'm using disempowering language 
And one of the most disempowering words you can use is I'm trying, I'm trying. Um, and the reason why is that trying means you're separate from it. If you already had it, if you were already at a hundred thousand dollars a year, a million a year, if you were already, you know, had the company, you would, you wouldn't say I'm trying to create this. You'd say, no, I created this. So one of the things he said that I loved so much was stop trying to create, just fall in love with what you're creating. Because when we try, it means we're separate from it. So what if you thought about it that way? And what if trying to create something, what if you just fell in love with the vision of it and fell in love with not just the vision of it, but the person you're going to become along the way. And that's something I've been reminding myself of, um, and probably not enough. It would actually be powerful to remind myself of that more this week. As I say that out loud is who are you becoming Elise? Like, wow, I don't, I don't quite know that woman yet. Um, but she's, she's an elevated version of my old self and I get to fall in love with her and you get to fall in love with you and you get to fall in love with both what you're creating from a physical standpoint, as well as the version of you that you're creating. And I think the second is so much more important because again, you're going to be with yourself for a long time. You might as well fall in love with you. Right? <laughs> so fall in love with what you're creating. Stop trying to create number nine. And this is so good. I mentioned to you earlier that I've been going through the motions a bit in my meditation recently and in my visualization. And I think it was that <laughs> I'm laughing as I say this, cause I just had an aha. I had, uh, reached a point in this past, like before I went to the conference where I was kind of like, huh, I wonder what's next. I had created some really big, really big things in my life in this past year. And some, there were definitely challenges. There were definitely things that felt like big flops, but there was also some really big success. And I went into this conference kind of like, where do I go from here? Like how, I don't know, like everything just felt like, man, I just had like a peak manifestation <laughs> and I don't really know how it gets better than this. I mean, I had next level vision and I, but I was feeling kind of not complacent, but, um, just content. And I remember as I went into this again, this is an aha for me, but I'm laughing because now I realize why everything started shifting so fast, <laughs> um, going into it being like, well, what is next? And maybe I need to shake things up a little bit to like get, you know, get some of that energy and get some of that fierceness back that I had earlier last year. Well, sure enough, I'd been kind of going through the, mo my, my morning routine and my meditation had reflected that same kind of like level of energy with things. Again, it wasn't bad. It was just, it was kind of content and like, Ooh, I, I feel really good. Um, but what he said, what Joe said that was, really, really beautiful is the divine in you will always match your efforts. So I want you to write that down. If you're taking notes, the divine in you will always match your efforts. And this is the, this is the shift. I mean, for, for someone like me, or maybe like you, I don't know if you grew up in a conservative, um, like very traditional, religious household. I grew up in a very conservative Christian household. And when we prayed, it was always to something outside of us. It was always like, Oh, please, please save me. Please help me. And this is, this isn't meant to be no disrespect to anyone's religious affiliation or upbringing. I'm just sharing my own experience here. But when the way that Joe talks about prayer, which I, um, which I love is like, how would you get up if you knew your prayers were already answered? And you weren't dependent on something outside of you to make the shift. But if you knew that there was divine in you that was capable of shifting or changing anything, but the divine in you will always match your efforts. So if you show up for your morning meditation or your morning journaling or your routine, and you're kind of like, nah, ho hum, like, let me do this. I'm going to check some email. I'm going to journal because I have it on my checklist of what to do in the morning, but I'm not really intentional about it. Well, guess what? You're going to get back. You're putting in mediocre effort. So you're going to get back a really mediocre result. 
So we have to learn to be so much more intentional with what we do and with that time and to say, all right, divine source, all that is inside of me, I'm here and I'm serious about creating this change. I'm serious about making this shift. Like I'm not playing around, but I know that you're going to match my efforts. So I'm going to come to you with such focus and such intention and such, remember the energy of the divine is wholeness and love. So I'm going to come to you with that energy because I'm going to be a match for you. And then I'm going to know that I can trust that if I want a miracle, if I want biblical level, like miracle shifts to happen in my life. I've got to come at it from that energy. Watch out. That's all I have to say. And if you've experienced it, you know, watch out because that effort will be matched back to you. And that is how it works. So it's not giving your power away to something outside of you. It's not being at effect of anything outside of your life. It's if I want to experience the divine, I have to be divine. And what would it look like to be divine in this moment? What would it look like to be divine in this morning meditation? What would it look like to be the mystic? What would it look like to be divine? Not just on the meditation mat after, but afterwards too, all throughout the day. And remember that if I have a great meditation, but then I have 12 hours of anxiety and fear and blame and victimhood, what do you think you're going to get in your life? You don't, you're not exempt during those 12 hours, you got to carry that with you all through the day. It's not, it's, it's not a limited thing to just when you're doing your mindset work, you've got to carry that with you all through the day. So this is the self-awareness piece is critical and you're not going to be perfect with it. I'm not perfect with it. We're not meant to be. That's why we have those contrasting experiences so we can learn and grow, but we want to keep coming back and coming back and coming back to how would the divine show up in this situation? And if I want the divine to show me next level results in my life, I got to show up that way first. So it all starts with you, my friend. And then number 10, and I just want to end on this. He said this a number of times, and this was really beautiful to me that there is always more love to experience. There's always more love to experience. And he shared stories of just feeling so blissed out and so in love with life and some really cool things that happened to him when he was in those States. Um, but then asking, is there even more love to experience? And then having experiences where, yes, there is more. And that's been one of the downloads that he has taken from his own work is there is always more love to experience. And I think if we could ask that question every day, in addition to the other questions, if your brain is like mine, it's asking all sorts of questions all day long. (laughs) How are we going to do this? What am I going to eat for lunch? (laughs) But in addition to those questions, it's is there more love to experience in this situation? And could there be more love to experience today? And there is, there always is. And so I just want to end on that note. And I want to just say thank you to you for taking the time to listen today. Um, This episode was, it was a lot to try to condense, try, there you go. It was a lot to condense into one episode, but I'm sure I'll be weaving more of my learnings from the event and more of my experiences from the event into future episodes. Cause it just, it becomes you, it sticks with you. I would love and be so honored if this spoke to you, if you shared it with a friend, share it on social. Uh, I want to get to know you. If, if we're not connected yet on social, you can connect with me at Elise Archer everywhere. And I would just love to get to know you more. And my, my aim is always just to provide content that helps inspire you and helps you achieve, yes, your sales and your business goals, but doing it in a different energy than I think many of us have been taught to do in our lives before. So that was it, my friend. I can't wait to hear your takeaways. Please comment below this episode. If you're, um, you know, if you're seeing my post about it on social or on YouTube comment below, let me know what your biggest takeaway was. I'm so inspired and so grateful for this experience. And I I hope you'll prioritize getting to one of his events um, at some point this year, because it was really, really life-changing. So 
that is it, my friend. I'm wishing you a beautiful, beautiful rest of your day. Thank you so much for listening. And I'll see you next week with our next episode of She Sells Radio. Bye for now.